Welcome, uh, everybody. Good afternoon. And uh, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you to the UBC Emeritus College Annual General Meeting 2022. Uh, I'm Joost Blom, uh, Professor Emeritus of Law and uh, Principal uh, in the year that's just concluding. And um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And of course, uh, you in our audience are joining us today from many places near and far. And I acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Uh, as you see on the slide, uh, the meeting is in basically three parts. The first part being a business meeting uh, for about half an hour. Uh, then uh, the awards ceremony to present our two awards uh, for this year, uh, which should run uh, until about two. And then uh, the presentation by Professor David Wilkinson, uh, followed by a, a question and answer session. Um, I should uh, warn you, everybody, that uh, at five minutes to two, which is sort of towards the end of our, the, the scheduled end of the, the award ceremony, there will be this alert ready in which everybody's cell phone is going to make a, a, a loud sound uh, to test this sort of alert system that the government is uh, is uh, alert is using uh, to advise of weather emergencies and so on. Um, so anyway, that may momentarily interrupt <laughs> the the last part of our award ceremony. Uh, I just be prepared for for that interruption if it if it if it, it does amount to an interruption. Um, so the first uh, part of uh, the uh, business meeting is the uh, somewhat sad one, which is to uh, remember all the members of the Emeritus College who have died during the past year, and we will put those names up for you on the slide, and when they are up, um, I will, can we just have the names please on the Who is, who is running the slides? Thank you. Um, could I ask, invite everybody to observe uh, a moment or two of silence. I will uh, call us back to order uh, just to reflect on those of our colleagues who uh, have died during the past year. Thank you very much, everybody. The uh, next uh, part of the business uh, is to uh, approve the agenda as circulated in the newsletter um, and uh, also the minutes uh, of the uh, previous annual general meeting. And those minutes, again, were circulated to all members in the April newsletter, the, the final newsletter of the year, um, along with the announcement of this meeting and the agenda. So um, could I have a motion, please? And I think we can take the two, uh, well, we, let's take them separately. Agenda first, any, uh, if I can have a motion to approve the agenda from anyone who chooses, Graham, thank you. And uh, is there a seconder for that? 
I can only see two of you, Alan, thank you. So I'm afraid you're doomed to be the mover and seconder. Um, and um, any discussion or problem with the agenda? Well, I'll take that as, uh, I'll take that as an approval. And um, then the minutes of our previous annual general meeting, again, could I have Graham move and, and Alan second uh, uh, the approval of the minutes. And again, I invite, if anybody has a problem, uh, please use the, the chat function to, um, uh, or, or I, I think it may also work if you raise your electronic hand, um, if you have any comment to make. If there are no problems with the minutes, again, I, uh, we have the motion to approve. Uh, is there anybody against approving the minutes? Please signal in whatever way you can. All right, then I'll take those minutes as approved. Thank you. Now, uh, a short report from me um, on the past year. Um, and uh, if the, the slides are, yes, the, the slides are operating with a bit of a lag. So we'll just wait for the first slide to come up. Um, so, uh, one of the things which you may have noticed if you looked at the uh, minutes of the, the last meeting uh, is that I, when I was giving the sort of look forward at the end of that meeting last year, I optimistically talked about the way in which we would be transitioning back to in person during this year and, and so on and so forth, very little of which has actually occurred. Um, and uh, so the, we were in yet another year of basically virtual uh, operation uh, with just a couple of notable exceptions. Um, uh, the, just to give you the current snapshot of the membership, um, uh, the, uh, there are some 1300 members uh, of the Emeritus College for whom we have email addresses uh, and there, in we know that in theory there are another 500 or so members of the college because anybody who is emeritus, uh, a faculty uh, at UBC, uh, in either of the two campuses, um, is a member of the college. So in total, there are 1,800 people who are members of the college, but 1,300 with whom we are actually in contact. Um, and each year, the uh, President Ono holds a reception to welcome the new uh, emeritus uh, members of the Emeritus College, and that took place this year virtually. Uh, it started out being planned as in person, but ended up being virtual uh, back in September. Uh, and the uh, there the sort of ad additional new members. This year uh, is about 67 new members by my count from the two campuses. And if we could just go to the next slide, the uh, yes, it's year two of the pandemic. I've mentioned that virtually everything we <laughs> virtually everything we've done has been virtual, um, and uh, that includes we were going to be holding in a, a week or two. Uh, the National Conference of CURAC, the Colleges and University uh, Retiree Associations of Canada, uh, they have an annual, in used to have an annual in-person conference, and we were to host it. And it was being planned as in-person until about late summer last year, and then it too had to uh, be turned into an, a virtual event. Uh, which is going to happen on May the 19th. Um, but it, it's just one example where a, a lot of what we had planned or hoped we could do just didn't work out the way that uh, because of the, the pandemic and the successive waves that we have had. Um, so there, as I mentioned on the slide, there have been some, uh, some good things uh, come out of this uh, going virtual. 
Uh, member access to events, of course, has become much easier, uh, both in terms of time to get there and, um, and, and where you are. You can, you can participate in events uh, from anywhere. So that, that's been a very good thing. Uh, and we, one of the challenges for the, if we go back to fully in-person uh, capability uh, is whether we retain some part of that uh, online uh, uh, attendance. And uh, the other advantage uh, along with, I mean, most of, most of the pandemic was disadvantage, but the, the, the access part is, it was one positive side and the other was it financially it has made life easier for us in the sense that expenses for in, in certain departments were way down um, and so uh, that that has uh, as you will find find in the financial report uh, that has uh, had an impact on our on our operating budget but uh, those apart from those uh, the, the the challenges were were more serious than the than the advantages. Um, if I yes, so I've just like to um, do a brief sort of uh, run through what I think are the most notable sort of uh, things that have happened or been part of our Emeritus College activities over the past year. And I've sort of classified them under, uh, I, I've sort of broken down the purposes of the college into sort of 10 purposes uh, and uh, just to indicate the wide range of things that the college does and is set up to do. Uh, and and what has been happening in in each of those uh, parts of its uh, of its mandate? Um, first of all, uh, representing the interests of the emeriti uh, in relation to university policy matters that affect uh, emeriti. Um, and I mentioned the regular meetings that uh, Vice Principal Ann Junker and I have had with uh, the Vice Provost Moira Quayle. Um, and a theme which is simply carried on from previous years uh, has been uh, how emeriti can be more fully integrated into UBC systems and services. Um, because at the moment we, we don't fit. We, we are part, part out and part in, and, and, uh, and it's often rather difficult to know exactly whether it's one or the other, uh, but we, we're working on it. And uh, the, the uh, vice provost has been very helpful. And um, one front on which we have been pushing forward is on the access to uh, IT systems, uh, where I think we are making some headway. Um, second uh, purpose is to support college members' personal retirement arrangements. And here the signal event of the year was held just recently, the uh, a revived, after two years, I think, a hiatus, a revived seminar for faculty who are approaching retirement. And uh, all kudos to Linda Leonard and her uh, transitions to retirement committee, uh, because the, she and the committee really pushed to, uh, to revive this, uh, this annual event. Uh, and faculty relations was really took it on and, and sponsored it and uh, great thanks to them and uh, the it got terrific reviews the the event that was held and there were about a hundred people who would have liked to attend but couldn't so we're hoping to put another one on uh, in the very near future and I just mentioned the ben our benefits committee also continues to provide information, current information on health and travel insurance and other benefits. If we can go to the next slide. Um, supporting uh, the, our members scholarly activities of which there are many The, of course, the main financial support that we can offer is the 100,000 a year from the provost's office uh, that it, we use to subsidize uh, emeritus uh, college members scholarly expenses by way of a reimbursement um, and um, the 
it, one of the other things that there is a, our continuing scholarly activity and engagement committee um, has organized this last week the council and for committee members on the UBC indigenous strategic plan. And um, that, uh, that was a very useful and, and energizing session. Uh, and so we're, uh, we look forward to, to moving forward in that area as well. Um, and the, there is also a, a recent uh, sort of uh, expression by the vice provost international that they, they that office would very much like uh, interested emeriti to become involved in they, they highlight three particular initiatives uh, the global virtual classrooms initiative global engagement heat map project which is about the global engagement activities on this campus and uh, the stories that profile global projects in, involving emeriti another sort of uh, endeavor that the office is embarked on. And uh, further information uh, is available, uh, just, just ask. And uh, interested, emerit and they, they should be uh, 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 circulated in an alert, which will give fuller particulars about this. Um, and uh, there, there are two email addresses there on the screen for you uh, if you wish to contact the Vice Provost International's office about participating in any of these initiatives or in, in or they say and in, in, in also invite uh, in any other initiative. Um, the, uh, I, there's a question if I may answer it as I go along from Ken Craig uh, whether the 100,000 was fully expended, the answer is no, that's one of the savings uh, because nobody's traveling or has been. Um, and so that, is the, um, that fund is currently not fully spent. Um, and and uh, we anticipate that once travel is back in full swing, uh, there will be a considerable call on that fund to support uh, that, that expense. Um, the fourth uh, item here is to provide uh, events for members intellectual and social enjoyment. Um, and here the, I just list the various events that were held during the past year. I think my count is right, although I think I may be out one or two. Um, the general meetings, I know we've had five if you count this one, uh, including the, one of the few in-person events was a wonderful concert on in November by Jane Coop and David Gillum, um, just in between the fifth and the sixth wave of the COVID. Um, the uh, Green College series on intergenerational trauma consisted, I think, of seven events and again, it concluded with one in-person event in the old auditorium. That was a terrific series. Senior scholars interviews, uh, which were fascinating, uh, six of those, two, I think, college conversations, um, and then the special interest groups, uh, photo, poetry, film, travel, and then a couple of new ones, uh, community volunteer group, um, the easy riders group for cycling, and the reading group have been added to the special interest group uh, lineup. Uh, and uh, just two in-person events that were traditionally in person, Philosopher's Cafe and the research seminar, annual research seminar, have continued to be suspended uh, because of COVID restrictions. Um, on, yeah, and promoting members' social and civil engagement with the campus community, um, we, the Okanagan Senate uh, has approved a, a, a sort of motion to recognize and support uh, an Okanagan chapter for all the Emeritus College members who live in the Okanagan region. Um, and again, during the, while COVID restrictions were in place, the in-person events which were contemplated for that chapter couldn't happen. But now that that is beginning to look more likely, 
again. Um, we hope that that chapter will become the the means by which members in the Okanagan area uh, will be able to, uh, to uh, participate more fully in, in what the college uh, does. Um, the uh, also had a, a meeting with Campus Vision 2050 uh, and uh, to discuss the strategic plan for the campus uh, in which many emeriti are interested and I mentioned also the President's Advisory Committee on Campus Enhancement, which has emeritus faculty on it. Uh, civic engagement, uh, social engagement with the larger community is another part of our mandate. Uh, and the new community volunteer special interest group is very active uh, in that uh, particular uh, activity. The uh, recognition of members' achievements. Well, today's meeting is a good example. Uh, we're going to uh, recognize two uh, award winners, um, uh, the two awards that are adjudicated by the Emeritus College. Uh, and uh, we also, uh, as you may notice in the newsletter, highlight members who receive awards and honors. Um, and the, the communications, You, uh, many of you are you, good users of them, the website, the newsletter, the alerts, and so forth. That's an important part of what we do. And the next slide um, is our activities with the other associations. So the, I've mentioned the CURAC virtual assembly uh, coming up on May the 19th. And as part of that virtual assembly, Linda Leonard, who is the as I've mentioned, the chair, the chair of our Transitions to Retirement Committee will, I, will receive a tribute award from HURAC uh, for her uh, really outstanding work to provide service to our college members and soon to be members of the, the ones who are, are approaching retirement. Um, and we also held back in October uh, a joint virtual event with the European Association of Professors Emeriti. Lastly, I think the last slide uh, is, we can skip that one. It just reports on our council meetings. Uh, and the last, on the last slide is just to express thanks. Um, I would really like to thank the, the whole enterprise uh, of our college is, is totally powered by volunteers um, and uh, and there are a lot of them um, starting with uh, the council members that that uh, met the, you the members elect um, the uh, and the committee chairs and uh, members of committees uh, that do so much of the great work uh, in the college uh, conveners of particular event series um, like the, the Green College, uh, Emeritus College uh, Intergenerational Trauma program, uh, Lecture Series that was held this year, an outstanding series. Um, you, our, our unit representatives, we have a, a whole, uh, in, we try to have one representative from each of the campus units. We, there are a few which are currently not, uh, sort of we don't have anybody for, but uh, basically we have, are these representatives link us with every part of the campus. Um, we've of course had terrific speakers at our events, some of whom are members, but some of whom are not. Um, and I could just, it's, you should never pick out people for special thanks because you're gonna leave out people uh, that you should have also included. But I, there are two people here who, uh, they are coming at the, have come to the end of their uh, term and they've been uh, doing an outstanding job for the college for uh, for some time and both of them and uh, so I would just like to acknowledge Carolyn Gilbert uh, who has been our program cluster coordinator for the last uh, years uh, and really has has sort of masterminded the, uh, the the programming of the events of the college uh, and also Mar Marjorie Fee, I would like to acknowledge uh, as an outstanding editor for our newsletter, who again is coming to the end of her term. 
And uh, if I can also uh, just thank the members of the staff, Sandra von Ark, Christina Girardi, Pia Riley, and the Work Learn student, Sharon Sue. And thank you everybody uh, for um, allowing me and, and supporting me in being your principal over the last year. And I continue in office uh, until the end of June, but this is the last time that I will uh, sort of be able to speak to you at a general meeting. So thank you very much. Now I'll turn things over to Alan Mackworth for the financial report. Thanks, Joost. Um, so I'll give a, a brief overview of the um, last financial year, state of counts, 21-22. Um, we'll start with just a, a high level picture. We have five accounts, basically, the operating college, CURAC, endowment capital, endowment spending. The operating account is really just only GPOF uh, funds from the university which uh, well, we can't move it to another account. The college account is for non-GPOF funds. And you'll see that uh, on the carryover column is where the state of those accounts at the end of the last financial year, 20 to 21. So that's what we're carrying over. The revenues, the next column, followed by the expenses. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see the state of the accounts at the end of uh, March. 22. So that's the balance that will be carried forward into this current financial year. So the next slide will give you a picture of the operating account. These are the GPOF funds. And the high level view here is that uh, this year we're generating a surplus around 69K. We're carrying forward around 45K from the previous year. So we're carrying forward into the current year about 114K. And that essentially is due to underspending of the research subsidy that uh, Yost mentioned. So the research subsidy were granted 100K a year. And yet this year we expended what we could on all legitimate requests, spending only 21K. The operating revenues for the college almost entirely spent on salaries and benefits and office and admin there was fully spent and we had a 2% budget cut, which we have to take into our revenue account, giving us a total revenue of 237K. On the right-hand side, because of this underspending in the research subsidy, the expenses are only 168K, giving us the surplus for this year, around 69K in the operating account. So next we'll see the uh, Endowment capital account, these funds are invested by the university on our behalf, and we are allowed to spend uh, a certain fraction varies each year, depending on the performance of the fund. Uh, we wanted to build it up at least to 200K before we actually spent any of these funds. So we've carried over again from the previous year, 166K. We transferred in from the endowment spending. We decided not to spend that. We put it into the capital account seven and a half K. And we also transferred in from the college account, 45 K. So along with the investment income in the, in the previous year, that gives us a current status of the endowment capital around 230 K, which is now very healthy. And now we can start considering spending on special projects from the uh, investment income generated by that fund. So next slide, we'll look at the college account. This was, some of this came from the uh, previous APE that uh, we carried forward into the college accounts. And we're carrying forward a fairly healthy surplus there of 81K. Johnson's insurance scheme gives us a rebate for any of our members who use the Johnson insurance. And we also got a donation of 24.8K for an artwork, which we have purchased, as we'll see in the expenses, spending 32.595K on the artwork, which will be a feature of the doors in our new space when they are installed. And one of the expenses on the college account was to transfer out the 45K to endowment capital. Actually, that was 25K from the year before last, 
and 20K from this last year uh, because of a, an accounting situation. So our total expenses in the college account were 79.5 carrying forward again, a, a surplus of 51K. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see again the summary account. So this is the a high level view. And again, we're looking at the operating account, we brought in 44K and we, we've reached a balance a carryover of 113K primarily because of the underspending in the research subsidies. And you'll see the other uh, balances there and the surpluses generated in almost every account. And so uh, if you look at the total increase from year to year, it, in terms of our current accounts, 125K turned into 165K and the endowment account went from 167 to 230K. So the summary is that our uh, financial situation is very healthy. Uh, we have an opportunity to spend further either on new staff, which we desperately need. We've been turned down by the university for an additional staff request. We hope that that will be fulfilled in the coming year or two. Um, that's one possibility for additional spending on temporary staff or on special projects that the council might decide to fund. So the next slide, we'll just give you the names of the committee members. Uh, I was very honored to chair and appreciated the opportunity and the challenge of chairing the finance committee. Richard Unger was the previous chair and he certainly helped me a lot. I did the other members and in particular, Sandra Van Ark was tremendous support and help in uh, carrying us through in a very healthy financial situation. So I don't think we have time for questions. We have a very tight schedule, but I'm happy to answer questions uh, by email or possibly through the chat if you have any questions. And at this stage to move right on, I I'd like to introduce Graham Wynn who will uh, report the results of the election of new members of the council. Graham. Thank you, Alan. Uh, and thank you, Yus, both of you for your leadership uh, through this year. Uh, the college is obviously in very good shape and space and uh, you deserve appreciation for that. Um, my report can be brief. Uh, this report on the results of the elections for new members of the council is one of the uh, more pleasant duties uh, and one of the few duties actually of the past principal of the college. And I'm happy to say that uh, we are in very good shape. Uh, first, I must thank the two members of the college who joined me on the nominations committee, uh, Bill McCutcheon and Linda Leonard, and thank them for their very considerable support and input. Uh, we met initially uh, to brainstorm and generate lists of potential candidates for the offices that we had to fill. Uh, that was a very productive discussion. We generated a long, long list for council members and for vice principal, and we then met to winnow them down. Uh, we were uh, somewhat pessimistic, I think, in our deliberations because we generated uh, sizable shortlists of potential candidates. And the happy news is that when we approach people, uh, we were generally met with uh, enthusiasm uh, for the idea that they should join the uh, Emeritus College in an executive position. So uh, we have a list of people who we considered of high potential, but who have not uh, been approached. And I think this is an augury of the health of the, uh, the college as well. So let me just uh, inform you of our new members. Uh, obviously, our new principal will be Anne Junker, who previously was our vice principal. Uh, Anne has served on council, and I know from working with her that we're in good hands going forward. So congratulations, Anne, and thank you. Uh, I'm delighted that Paul Harrison 
has agreed after a year on council to serve as our vice principal. And uh, Paul brings a great deal of university service and know-how about the operations of the university from his time on Senate and in other committees uh, to his new role as vice principal, converting to principal in the year following Anne's principalship. So again, thank you, Paul, and congratulations on your elevation to leadership in the college. We're in good hands. If we could go to the next slide. Uh, we had, because uh, Paul was moving from the council to a vice principal position, four vacancies. Uh, Paul Rogers from Pediatrics uh, agreed to take uh, the two-year term that was left remaining uh, by Paul's elevation. And thank you, Paul, for doing that. Uh, these terms are renewable. And so I hope that you won't feel that you have had short shrift uh, in only having two compared with the three others, each of whom have regular three-year terms. Those three others are Neve Kelly from Pathology, who already has been very active in the volunteer group and in other ways in the Emeritus College, Wendy Hall, who has also given us committee service, and Vijay Verma from Triumph, who uh, has also served on the uh, scholarly engagement uh, committee previously. So we are joined by four new council members, all of whom are very committed to the enterprise of the college, who bring very different experiences and commitments with them. And I am delighted to welcome them and thank them for uh, taking the leap. I hope it's not just a leap of faith, but a leap encouraged by a sense of the potential of the college and a commitment to realizing that. I know from conversations with all of these people that that is the case. And so uh, I'll conclude my report with uh, thanks and congratulations to one and all. Uh, it was a pleasure. So I'm just waiting for the slide. Thank you. We end the business meeting uh, by thanking council members whose terms end on uh, June 30th. And uh, you can uh, see these people and uh, read their positions. Uh, as a past principal, uh, Youst uh, will chair the nominating uh, committee um, this next year. Uh, Graham remains on council as an ex officio uh, member. Um, in addition uh, to his roles on uh, council and past chair of the finance uh, committee, um, Michael McEntee has contributed to a number of ad hoc uh, committees and we thank him for that work. Uh, Richard Unger, uh, uh, as a member at large, was also past chair of the finance committee. And uh, Marjorie uh, Fee, uh, we have uh, already given uh, special thanks uh, in her uh, significant commitment as newsletter editor. I'd also like to give thanks to Carolyn uh, Gilbert and Richard Spencer and Paul Morantz for their uh, leadership of the three college uh, clusters in addition to committee work. And I give a special thanks to Joost. It's been a pleasure to work with Joost and to see his guidance and wisdom in managing college activities. I echo Joost in acknowledging our terrific staff who provide us with considerable commitment and much support. Uh, looking forward, as Joost has said, we want to continue to raise the profile of the college and of Emeriti in general, and ensure that you have the opportunity to be involved if you so desire in UBC initiatives. This year we connected with a number of key university activities and we will see how you and the college uh, can be involved going forward in the Indigenous Strategic Plan, the vision for the campus 2050, the climate and nature emergency, and the global engagement strategy. We also hope to see new special interest groups form pandemic restrictions dependent, Richard Spencer has uh, developed a guidance document for how the SIGs start up, and this is posted on the website if you are interested. I'm looking forward to the coming year and continuing to work with all of the wonderful people associated with the college. Thank you. And I now hand this over 
I don't believe we uh, will, we can potentially answer questions if they, these come up to chat, but in the interest of time, I introduce Mark Thompson uh, for the awards uh, ceremony. Thank you, Anne. It is my honor and pleasure to uh, introduce you to the award winners uh, for uh, this year. Uh, I'm ably assisted by my committee, um, uh, Lynn Smith from uh, Law and Jim uh, Zittick from Statistics. Jim was a previous winner and contributed uh, very well to our deliberations. And we were very ably supported by the staff. There's a lot of paper involved in this activity and they were uh, very helpful. There are two awards that the college uh, recognizes and these are for emeriti uh, activities post-retirement. Uh, many of our members continue to contribute in many ways uh, after their uh, teaching service is completed. And each of them gets the recognition plus a check for a thousand dollars, which we uh, expect would be donated, frankly, to one of the causes that they've supported. The first award we have is the President's Service Award or the President's Award for Distinguished Service. And this is presented uh, by President Ono uh, himself, he is unable to be with us in person today, so he uh, will do so uh, virtually. Although I can't be with you in person, it gives me great pleasure to present the President's Award for Distinguished Service by UBC Emeriti to Dr. Frank Tester. The award recognizes UBC Emeriti who have demonstrated exceptional effort or leadership in volunteer community contributions since attaining UBC Emeriti status to benefit of society in Canada or internationally. Through the award, we celebrate and honor Emeriti who have consistently demonstrated outstanding achievements beyond their scholarly work. Dr. Tester was selected for his research into the structural origins of social issues and the policies and practices that address them. He is an award-winning documentary filmmaker and author, known both nationally and internationally for his advocacy and work on collaborative and community development approaches to problems like young infant suicide, housing and living conditions, food security, and the impacts social, cultural, and environmental of resource development projects. Dr. Tester, I am proud to present you with a 2022 President's Award for Distinguished Service by UBC Emerita. Congratulations. Thank you, President Ono. And uh, we would like to now have uh, Frank describe some of the work which resulted in his uh, award, which was very richly uh, deserved. He was practicing uh, reconciliation before it was fashionable. And uh, thank you very much, Frank. Uh, we're interested in hearing what you have to say. Well, thank you. I mean, I'm, I was both surprised and honored to receive this. I, I think that's probably a rather common uh, uh, reaction. I was actually driving, I, I fit the stereotypical emeritus professor. I drive an old Volvo. So when I got a call on my cell, I had to pull over to the side of the road and answer. I, I, uh, I didn't recognize the number. So I was quite convinced somebody had a wrong number. And then when I talked to Christina, I was convinced that maybe she had the wrong name. So uh, <laughs> I, was, uh, I was truly surprised and I'm honored. Um, I think it goes without saying, you know, that that um, we are and who we become are uh, have a great deal to do with the choices that we make, and and not only that, but the choices that we're afforded. And I think any of us who are uh, emeritus professor have to recognize our privilege. 
uh, I came from a family with a father who never graduated from public school. So I, I have a pretty good idea of what privilege looks like. Um, and uh, there's just no denying that uh, privilege uh, affords all kinds of opportunities and choices, which have a lot to do with who you become. It also comes, privilege also comes with costs. Um, before, uh, I, I mean, I've been working as a volunteer and I helped form the Vancouver Association for Restorative Justice. Uh, and I've worked on uh, a number of other things uh, since I retired, including uh, work uh, for, with Inuit in the Eastern Arctic, dealing with a proposed mine expansion. But prior to that, I, I also worked uh, in the late 80s as a brigadista in Nicaragua during the Contra War and uh, in the 90s uh, in Mozambique with, with uh, uh, collecting weapons at the end of the Renamo Felimo conflict and working with child soldiers. We took the arms and uh, with Project Plowshares, as we called it, worked with artists in uh, Maputo, Nucleo de Art, a group to turn the uh, weapons into works of art. And uh, I also work with child soldiers. So, so I want to, I mention this because uh, I, uh, I relate this experience to what confronts all of us at this particular moment in time. And that of course is what's going on in the Ukraine. But we also not, ought not to forget uh, what has happened recently in Syria, Afghanistan, well, many other countries. Um, I think of the uh, countless, and there are going to be hundreds of thousands, especially uh, women and children, who are going to have lifetime scars as a result of, uh, of uh, these experiences. It suggests to me that all of us, or any of us in the academic community that can contribute to addressing the ongoing pain and suffering of so many people, you know, now is the time, in fact, to roll up our sleeves and, uh, and do something in any way we can, especially as many of these as refugees and, and immigrants are going to uh, find their way to our country and our city. But there are costs, as I said, associated with doing this kind of work. And uh, I think that draws my attention to the need for community, people who actually care about each other, know each other, and uh, knowing has a lot to do with caring and support each other in the work that they do. And I'd like to recognize the works of the Emeritus College in bringing uh, retired professors together as a community uh, to create, in fact, what maybe we didn't have during our tenure. Uh, I, I note with regret, for example, when it comes to community, the loss of the faculty club. But I also notice a change in culture that keeps people isolated and at their desks uh, many, many hours a day, uh, and then working together in meetings with people that they don't really know, which means that the working relationships are affected accordingly. Um, so it's time to pay attention, I think, to a community that works well together and people who know one another. Otherwise, bureaucracies become punitive and personal, and they defeat what I think a university should be about, which is demonstrating in its practice, the very best of concepts like restorative justice, a sense of community, and a concern for others. So with that in mind, um, I, I again like to uh, say thanks very much. I, I greatly appreciate um, the recognition you've given. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, award uh, richly uh, deserved, and we're all very respectful of, of your uh, many contributions. Our second award is for excellence in innovative and creative endeavors uh, post retirement. And uh, Joost, I'll turn it over to you for the presentation to the 21 uh, 22 uh, winner. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, uh, it is my honor and, and my great personal pleasure to present the uh, Emeritus College Award for Excellence in Innovative and Creative Endeavors 
to Diana Larry, uh, Professor Emerita of History. Uh, and I regret uh, that we have been unable to <laughs> get the video link working with Diana. So uh, she will be participating, but, but by audio only, I'm afraid. Um, I, I, I'd just like to take advantage of some extracts from the nomination package uh, that was submitted uh, for Diana uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to just indicate how deserving a recipient she is for this award. Um, this is a, these are quotes from the nomination. Uh, Professor Larry has always opened new paths in her career, writing on the traumatic effects of modern Chinese warfare and enforced migration on ordinary people. Her focus is on the human suffering and resilience of people living through great hardship and violent times, partly in response to her own family history of wartime service, but also due to her longstanding personal and scholarly connections to China and the Chinese people from her time as an undergraduate at London University, her work as cultural attache today. Her latest book, which is called China's Grandmothers and was published last month by the Cambridge University Press, uh, shifts from war to the everyday lives of Chinese grandmothers emphasizing their essential support and emotionally central role in the lives of their grandchildren, drawing from memoirs, fiction, ethnographical accounts, and personal experience to weave a poetic and moving panoramic and intimate tapestry of the Chinese matriarch. The book embodies so much of what makes Diana Larry such a perceptive, wise and astute observer and scholar. It is a humane and deeply engaging read by someone who dares to go beyond standard academic confines to create something new and original. It is perhaps the most surprising outcome of the wave of scholarship that Diana has generated since her retirement in 2007. No one had even thought of this topic, China's grandmothers, until now. As a committed scholar who has continued to publish and present her work, and as an advisor and mentor to those studying or wishing to understand China from a deeply humane and compassionate perspective, always built on a foundation of solid research, Dr. Diana Larry is a worthy candidate for this Emeritus <laughs> College Award. She has been a model public intellectual, a compassionate and judicious historian, who takes seriously her responsibility to inform the public. She is truly a model scholar who has brought distinction to the university in general and to the UBC Emeritus College in particular. So Diana, it gives me great pleasure I... to virtually uh, hand this Emeritus mm -hmm. College Award for Excellence in Innovative and Creative Endeavors to you uh, congratulate you and invite you to say a few words. Please. Oh, yes, thank you so much. And I'm so sorry about the technological problems, but in spite of all our efforts, uh, once I was out of the meeting, uh, Zoom wouldn't let me back in again. Uh, but I'm happy to speak, and I hope you've got a, a, a slide showing what I call my three treasures, or possibly a copy of the book. Anyhow, what I want to say is that this is working on this book was an absolute joy. I enjoyed it far more than any of the books that I did before retirement. It's also the only book I ever did without a contract or a deadline at the end. I never knew whether it would be published. Um, but first, I want to say something about today. Today's May the 4th. In China, it's a day of great uh, importance because it was the beginning in 1919 of the movement towards modernism and nationalism. And it can't be celebrated very much in China today because it also included a celebration of democracy, but many people will be celebrating it nevertheless in quiet. And it's also 
the birthday of the most wonderful grandmother I've ever known, my own mother, who was born uh, 107 years ago on this day. At the moment, any moment now, I may be um, preempted by the alarm system. I'm just looking at my uh, phone to see the time. But let me just say a couple of things about how this book came into being. And one of which I'd recommend to a lot of people who are post-retirement if you have any nagging questions that you've never answered and you've never really had time to research, especially if they're fairly general ones, this is the time. I had a very great interest in how always how people in women in China often allowed their gave their children to be there it goes, the alarm. Okay. Can anybody hear me still? Hello? We can hear you, yeah. Oh, good. Um, people gave their infants to be looked after by their mothers or mother-in-law, which uh, for me would have been a completely always incomprehensible. But what I came to understand gradually is that in China, grannies were considered quite suitable people to look after children, small children. Um, that was my nagging question behind me, and it's become more intense in recent times because there are now in China at least 80 million children being looked after year round by their grandparents. They're what's called the left behind children. It's a very sad title, but it's the product of migrant labor who are not allowed to take their children with them. The other thing that was great for me is that just at the time I retired, I got these three beautiful grandchildren, uh, what they're called in China, in Chinese, my three treasures. Grandmothers always refer to their grandchildren as treasures. And uh, they've gave me a much greater happiness than I could really ever uh, have imagined. And they also, as I went through the various stages from infancy to now uh, mid to late teens, I saw what a special relationship this was and how seldom that it was really uh, paralleled uh, in other, in other uh, celebrated, I would say, in terms of the general relations. It also made me realize how much pressure in the West we put on mothers, parents, to be good parents and to be everything to their children. Uh, whereas children, if they're shared with their grandparents, even if the parents are around, are much easier, probably easier to bring up. So altogether, what I found working on this was a great deal of pleasure, some very interesting uh, intercultural comparisons. I had to be very careful not to be too sweeping with those. Uh, but above all, because I kept on checking in with my Chinese friends and colleagues and also doing a great deal of biography reading how common it was for people to really love their grandmothers. So this is a celebration and a hope for that kind of love that will um, spread even further because even though Chinese parents may be dragon parents or dragon mothers, uh, their grandchildren are soft and the grandparents are soft and loving and it's a wonderful role for anybody to emulate. So thank you very, very much for giving me this award like uh, my predecessor, I was completely stunned to get it. I hardly even knew it existed. And it's given me a tremendous amount of uh, pleasure and gratitude. Thank you very, very much. Hello? Hello? Thank you. This is all good. Thank, Thank you, you, Diane. Thank you, Diana. Uh, Oh, thank you. I'm so sorry about the technology, too. Well, you handled it with aplomb, as always. Okay. We all so, heard you. We this, all heard you. Oh, good. This concludes the awards presentations. Uh, it's a very fine moment in the life of the college. And uh, I now turn it over, the meeting over to Bill McCutcheon, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, today, we are delighted to have Professor David Wilkinson, 
uh, to speak to us. David is a professor and Canada Research Chair in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering here at UBC. His main research interests are in electrochemical and photochemical processes and devices and energy conservation uh, and storage materials and processes to creation and sustainable energy and water. Mark or David has 300 greater than 82 issued patents and 225 refereed publications and is a co-author of a book. Dr. Wilkinson has had 20 years of industrial experience in the areas of fuel cells, hydrogen, and advanced lithium batteries. He has worked at Ballard Power Systems, where he was a director and vice president of research and development at Molly Energy, and is executive director at Clean Energy Research Center here at UBC. Dr. Wilkinson was appointed the Order of Canada for his contributions to electrochemical science and engineering. Welcome, David. Uh, David did not hesitate for one minute, I don't think, when we asked him to give this presentation, so we appreciate that very much. The screen is now yours. I might Thank invite you. people to, first of all, if they want to ask questions, to put it on Q&A uh, or on the chat, and uh, we will answer them at the end. David will answer them. Thank you very much, uh, Bill, for the uh, for the introduction, and um, I'm honored to be here um, with the Emeriti. Um, obviously, uh, sharing uh, experiences with you and and hearing about your experiences as well is is very interesting. Um, some of what I'm going to talk about today was touched on already, actually, uh, by Dr. Tester and couple of other people in terms of the uh, impact of war and um, what, that, what that does to humanity. Um, I want today uh, to talk to you about the context of energy and where, where that's taking us and what the implications are with respect to energy, uh, to uh, geopolitical stability, sustainability, and climate change. Uh, we have some very large, some people would characterize the, them as existential threats. Um, and uh, energy is one of those areas or one of those pillars that's kind of, uh, you know, right at the forefront of that. So it's pretty hard to escape any uh, uh, publicity or reporting on that these days. It's pretty much in everything, everything you read. So hopefully the context of what I'm going to tell you will provide you with some uh, background uh, to understand some of the context for what's, uh, what's happening. Um, okay, so right now, just trying to ad advance my screen here. There we go. So um, I, I'm not going to uh, do a deep dive into some of the um, research areas that I'm doing, but I will, I will uh, mention uh, some of them as I'm going through my presentation. Uh, normally I would present this slide at the end of my presentation, um, but I just wanted to give you an idea of some of the areas that, that uh, our group, our research group works in. We've been um, here at UBC since 2004. Uh, it's a picture of uh, our group at the moment. So most of our research is done in the clean energy research area. And um, that obviously is related to um, carbon dioxide, uh, greenhouse gas uh, issues. It's uh, related to clean energy and clean water. Um, from a practical device point of view, we do a lot of work on fuel cells, electrolyzers and battery research, um, and also uh, conversion. Uh, to produce um, a clean fuels. So I'll talk a little bit about that as we move through. Um, my overview for today, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the global energy challenges and drivers. Those have changed quite significantly over the last 10 years. Uh, so it's important to, uh, to see what those changes are. 
Uh, then a bit about the climate, climate change and net zero 2050, which was the flagship report that came out from the uh, International Energy Agency last year. Um, you hear a lot about, particularly in Canada, about carbon capture usage and storage. I want to talk about that and whether it's a good or a bad thing or just highly politically motivated. Um, electrification uh, and renewables, uh, which is uh, part of the overall energy plan and where things are moving. And on the storage front, uh, what's happening there with respect to storage. Uh, then the environmental impact of some of the choices uh, that we can make um, and the supply, basically the supply chain and what, what that means. And um, then talk briefly about uh, the effect of energy on geopolitical stability and then end with some closing thoughts. So um, many people see energy as one of the biggest challenges we have for the 21st century. And you know, if our start in the 21st century is any indication, um, I, I think it really does verify it. Uh, we have wars being fought um, over uh, materials and over um, um, the ability to access uh, energy. Uh, it's a very important uh, challenge that humanity faces today. The other thing is that energy does form a nexus with many other things. I've just uh, mentioned a few things here. Um, the environment, of course, uh, it's very impactful on climate change and environment in general, uh, water, food and health. Um, with population growth and increasing demand on energy, we know that uh, the energy requirements will at least double uh, from their current level by the middle, roughly the middle of this century. And ideally, we should be getting that energy from some clean and sustainable uh, method. And ideally, it, it should be uh, available, readily available to people, and it should be cheap um, if we want to have uh, stability, geopolitical stability. Um, so here you, you see, um, in, in general, the uh, world population growth, I think our one of our most recent population counts is around 7.9 um, billion people at this, at this point. Um, you can see that the developing countries uh, population-wise are not developing um, at a significant rate um, at, the, at the moment. Uh, many drivers for that increase in world energy consumption, um, certainly um, you know, getting access to the same standard of living, um, etc. Um, you know, we had the uh, Kyoto Protocol, uh, which was set in 1997, um, to try to deal uh, with um, greenhouse gas emissions. And in that particular protocol, uh, the developed uh, countries were tasked with the responsibility for trying to deal with that. Uh, many people feel that that uh, that the Kyoto Protocol was a uh, complete failure and um, you know recently um, you know we've we've heard that in the the cope meetings and everything that all countries have to uh, have to take some uh, responsibility and be involved in the overall solution it can't just be a small sector uh, of countries so this is you know a change in the way thinking of how we're going to solve the problem um, has has evolved and by the way Antonio um, Guterres, um, we've probably seen him in the news recently when he uh, was in uh, Kyiv um, with missiles uh, um, being dropped on Kyiv at the same time. And he's very active and uh, a very strong proponent of trying to get climate change on track. So uh, where, where did we come from? Well, I think everybody's familiar that the Industrial Revolution started with coal in the 1700s uh, that le led to steam power, which replaced a lot of the traditional uh, kind of biomass uh, sources of, of energy. Um, other things happened, of course, the discovery of oil, you see there perhaps one of the first um, oil wells in, in Pennsylvania in 1859. Um, and that discovery started to change things uh, in dramatically. Um, Interesting enough, in the same period of time, 
um, there were renewables that were being used based on uh, wind power and on solar power. Um, but of course, with the discovery of oil and moving forward with, forward with industrial industrialization, um, we went down the, uh, the oil and gas path. And you can see then uh, with the industrial revolution, then we started to get into manufacturing um, we started to get electric grids, uh, and we started to get the whole power infrastructure, uh, which, which um, you know, our whole um, uh, globe has been based on since then. So, you know, one may ask, well, uh, you know, where, where are we going? Um, the top left-hand corner here, you see a McKelvey plot, which kind of shows what happens when your um, reserves are used up. Um, then uh, typically you start uh, moving into other areas of technology innovation, which um, you know have increasing cost, uh, or if you're at the other side, increasing uncertainty. Uh, we certainly saw that with the United States, with oil peaking in the 1970s, and then their uh, movement um, to shell oil uh, to become actually energy sufficient. Uh, and energy independence. So that was a very important move on the part of the United States uh, so that they didn't have to import oil um, any, anymore. And we've seen that with our oil sands uh, here in Canada, which is, is an unconventional source. There's a lot of upstream processing that's required uh, to do that, which causes an increase in the, in the cost. Um, and generally, I would say if you roll the clock back 10 years, what you would see is that um, sustainability of our fossil fuels was really the driving force, that we would you know, start to see peak oil, um, peak gas, peak uh, coal at some point in different jurisdictions. And that would have to drive some type of innovation to move uh, to other sources of energy. And you can, you can see in the bottom left-hand corner here, that only a very small percentage of our overall energy from this particular report around 2014, uh, only a small part of our energy requirements were gonna actually come from renewables or alternative sources. And still by 2050, a large percentage were coming from fossil fuels. So this was a sustainability driven um, approach uh, to you know, how we moved energy forward in the 21st century. And so we're, you know, faced with that question. We have, you know, we are in this Anthropocene uh, epoch now where we can, to some extent, control our destiny. And so the question is, you know, how long would we continue with oil and uh, gas? Um, but then the uh, issues with uh, climate change and the IPCC reports, the uh, Intergovernmental um, Panel on Climate Change, uh, the concern about that uh, started um, to take the, the place of sustainability in terms of driving um, the plan forward and where we needed to go with energy, that we couldn't continue to put greenhouse gas emissions at the rate that we were doing by burning fossil fuels uh, without uh, dire uh, consequences for the planet. So last year, uh, two major flagship reports came out. Uh, one was the IPCC report. This is the first working group. Um, the rest of the working groups are publishing this year. Um, they're very detailed reports, but also very, uh, very interesting. Um, the other report was the Net Zero 2050 report from the uh, IEA, the International Energy Agency, which actually lays out a plan of how we can get from where we are today uh, to 2050 and get to uh, net zero um, emissions. Net zero meaning whatever the equivalent amount of CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere, um, we remove the equivalent amount. So it doesn't mean that we're driving uh, you know, the CO2 emissions to zero. Uh, at the moment, they're around, I think, um, about 422 parts uh, per million. Um, but what it means is we, we reach some stable state where at least the amount of CO2 that's going into the atmosphere is balanced by the amount that we're taking out. 
So the IPCC um, did a number of different types of uh, analysis and scenario analysis, I should say. Uh, here I'm showing you uh, five different uh, scenarios. So there's some very aggressive approaches here to try to reduce the carbon dioxide on this axis here, it's carbon dioxide, a gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. And then the time here, calendar time out to 2100. Um, you can see that the most aggressive plan here actually crosses um, the zero axis around um, 2050. And this is the one that uh, the scenario largely that um, the IEA report was, was based on. Um, here we have um, at the top two uh, business as usual. One would be just a continuation of where we are now. And then the other one would be even a more uh, a more problematic scenario where we're actually putting more than business as usual um, emissions in, into the atmosphere. Uh, what I'll show you in the next slide is uh, the two uh, that show the impact on temperature that are taken uh, for one of the analyses are this 7.0 and this 2.6 one here. Um, the table here does show some of the impacts on temperature, but it's probably best to show you the next slide, uh, which is more uh, pictorial. So um, here you can see um, the temperature here in degrees Celsius. You can see uh, the, the calendar years are out to two, um, uh, 2100 here. Uh, these are the two scenarios here that I mentioned, the, the 2.6 or the you know, 2.6 and the seven scenario. Uh, the 2.6 is, is quite aggressive to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. And you can see we get some stabilization here around 2050 uh, with an increase uh, in temperature of about two, two degrees. However, if we take the moderate business as usual, um, you can see that there's still a significant increase uh, in temperature that's occurring and could be anywhere in the range of three to five, even six degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, so this is a very, a very, a very uh, sobering uh, scenario, and one that could lead to a very significant temperature increase uh, by 20, 2100. So uh, when we look now at the um, International Energy Agency Net Zero 2050 report, um, there's a lot of detail in that report. And what I've done is I pulled out a few uh, slides to go through uh, with you so you can get a feel for how the analysis was, was done and, and what, what, it act, what the, the future over the next 50 or, or next 25 years, 30 years looks like. Um, so you can see here where we are you know, somewhat today uh, with a certain number of gigatons of CO2 emissions, uh, what the report and the analysis takes into account is an increase with activity, that's um, use of, of, of energy and population increase. So that's, that's increasing all the time. And then the measures to try and decrease the gigatons of CO2. And you can see these are divided into different areas. We have uh, carbon capture and utilization, um, renewables, wind and solar, bioenergy, um, you know, all those sorts of things, including um, avoided demand, which is perhaps one of the easiest ways to uh, reduce carbon dioxide. And I'll talk a little bit about that with respect to COVID-19. So then that gets us to 2030, which is the shorter term goal, but we still have to get to 2050, which is the net zero goal. Uh, so here we see another increase in activity uh, due to demand and population growth, and then the measures here to get us back down uh, to zero. So um, this uh, analysis takes into account many, many different factors. It's, it's very detailed. Uh, here we look at the total energy supply um, in, um, in exajoules. Um, there's different, um, different uh, units that we can use here for, for the energy. Um, I should say that, you know, if you're thinking of a, of a benchmark, uh, may, an exajoule might be considered to be equivalent to 39 million tons of coal. So you can get an idea of the significant amount of energy that we're talking about. Um, so, you know, if we look where we started from here, uh, you can see that we were mainly fossil fuel driven, uh, which is where we started. 
um, here with coal, natural gas, and, and oil. Um, then you can see how when we get out to 2050 here that the amount of fossil fuels that we're using is significantly uh, reduced here. And you can see the composition now different from the other um, plots that I, a plot I showed you. Um, there is a significant amount of renewables that are taking up the energy gap that fossil fuels would have uh, filled at, in 2050. Uh, also interesting, if you look at that dashed line there, you'll see that there's a little in, indentation at the very top here uh, for the total amount of energy. Um, that's related to COVID-19, and that's mainly because of um, the reduced demand on energy. We were not using our energy systems as much. And that also is exact, exactly what happened with CO2 emissions too. It's actually the only thing we've seen as a planet so far where we've had some actually actual measured impact on decreasing carbon dioxide emissions um, in, uh, from a global perspective. Um, this became a very important uh, time, COVID-19, for actually studying how the planet recovers and, and what the impact is on, on, on emissions. Um, so very key uh, to this transition is really two aspects that are very key. One is reducing fossil fuel use and the other is the increase in electrification. And uh, here you can see the decrease uh, by decade here of unabated fossil fuels. That means we're not doing anything with them. They're still allowed to emit. And by 2050, we get to a very small amount. Um, in the IEA report, this small amount in 2050 is not, a, is not fuel based uh, petrochemical. It's petrochemicals that are used uh, for things like lubricants um, that do not uh, have an emission signature. So um, those are still unabated, but they're not contributing to overall carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, here we see the increase uh, from 2010 to 2050. Um, of low emission um, approaches uh, getting us to where we need to be at 2050. Again, you can see that there's a small, there is some amount of coal uh, and oil and natural gas, uh, but this would be um, using carbon capture and sequestration or carbon capture and utilization. So it would still have a very low emission. And then you can see the large role that uh, renewables are, are, are playing here. You know, and one may say, if you look at the composition of natural gas, it has much less carbon than, than oil uh, or coal. Um, so you might naturally say, well, fuel switching, and that has been an approach in the past, is a, is a really good way to go to reduce carbon dioxide. The issue is that methane has a much higher global warming potential. It means that it's, um, its impact on the environment is much greater uh, than carbon dioxide. So in the first 20 years, uh, you know, one molecule of methane is, is equivalent to about 86 um, molecules of carbon dioxide, and it does go down with time, uh, but it, the atmosphere is much more sensitive to, to methane than it is to carbon dioxide. So generally, another large change we're seeing is that where we might have used natural gas in the past, uh, we're now looking at its climate change potential and trying to replace it with other things like hydrogen. So that brings me to carbon capture, uh, utilization and storage. Uh, you'll hear a lot about that from the Canadian government, particularly with respect to Alberta. Uh, so we have our fossil fuel inputs because uh, we have large uh, reserves and resources of fossil fuels. Um, then they go through some type of process. So whether that's to produce blue hydrogen or they're, they're doing other uh, uh, petrochemical processes, they're producing carbon dioxide. We're trying to capture that carbon dioxide and ca carbon capture, then it has to go through compression and then it, it's either going to storage or it's going to utilization. So upstream of this, we have gas leakage. Downstream, we have gas leakage. We also have CO2 leakage in the, all these down, downstream areas as well. Plus we have to use some of this energy that we're putting in to our requirement here for the carbon capture as well. 
So then the question is, you know, what percentage capture are we actually getting? What is the over, does the overall process even make sense? And we know, for example, that the cost of using carbon capture can actually double, double the cost of, of your uh, resource here. Uh, so then I, that really needs to be taken into consideration if you're um, comparing it to other approaches. And I already mentioned that methane, you know, it has a, a large global warming potential. So these are all the, uh, the big question marks with carbon capture and utilization, which our government seems to be uh, hinging a, you know, a big part of our, our plan moving forward on. So with respect to that, I would uh, just draw your attention. I think uh, some of you will be aware of this, but we, we have a very large carbon and capture, uh, carbon capture and storage a facility in northern uh, Alberta. That's the Shell Quest project, which is a, is a, is a very large project. Uh, it's being used to produce what's called blue hydrogen. So it does have uh, carbon capture and storage. Um, and that's being used to refine bitumen at the uh, Scottford complex. It, it is uh, by far one of the largest and most successful CCS projects in the world. Uh, most of the uh, Politicians and people will state that there, you know, there's a 90 percent uh, capture of carbon dioxide emissions. Um, but in, uh, in a recent study that was done, actually doing a detailed analysis, uh, they found that only 39 to 48 percent of the emissions are actually being uh, captured. Uh, so it raises a very large question: you know, should you know, should Canada? be subsidizing this, this route in moving into future energy, especially for oil and gas companies that are already making very large uh, profits. The uh, oil and gas industry already is, is the most heavily subsidized um, energy uh, area. Um, and you'll see that in a moment, I'll explain that. I mean, uh, renewables uh, don't actually require subsidies anymore. They're um, sufficiently cost-effective now and commercial, uh, that they don't require that. I um, wanted to draw your attention to a letter that was written to the Prime Minister. A number of us were signees on that, uh, went to um, uh, the Prime Minister's office, I should say. Uh, Christy Freeland, um, it was addressed to her and copied to Jonathan Wilkinson, our new Minister of Environment and Climate Change. And basically, it's recommending that Canada not do this, uh, subsidize uh, carbon capture, uh, because it's a diversion. It's taking us away from the path that we actually really need uh, to take to be competitive in the, in the world from an energy point of view, and um, also to meet our, um, our climate commitments for 2050. Uh, here, I would just uh, let you know about some work that we're doing uh, and have done in the carbon in the carbon capture area. So um, we uh, we do a lot of work where we try to get multifunctionality out of out of um, the research that we're doing, and so we would look at you know energy input or whatever, uh, try to treat water, get chemicals out of that, also um, mitigate carbon dioxide. Uh, we've developed an, an advanced electrodialysis process uh, where we can feed carbon dioxide, uh, waste streams of wastewater or salt water, uh, and then we get CO2 converted to uh, chemicals that are useful and uh, desalinated water. So without even taking into, um, into account the cost of, uh, of carbon, so not even uh, putting that in, this is a profitable process. And uh, we were able to, uh, to win a grand challenge from emissions reduction Alberta because we were able to demonstrate that we could get a one megaton uh, capture uh, per year. So this is related to carbon capture. It does show with innovation that you, uh, you can actually uh, reduce the cost significantly and get other benefits. Generally speaking, in all the carbon loops that we're looking at from a uh, climate uh, change point of view, um, what we wanna do is, is have a net negative process. That means that the amount, we take away some of the carbon and actually get rid of it or mitigate it. 
And that's basically what this is showing is a closed loop here where we may have emissions from different sources, uh, whether it's flue gas or uh, burning or whatever. Uh, but if we introduce some form of renewable energy in there, maybe we're, uh, for example, producing hydrogen and then reacting the hydrogen with carbon dioxide, uh, then we get a net negative effect. That means there's less CO2 coming out than, than went in. So um, the uh, National Research Council of Canada has put quite a bit of, of effort uh, into funding work that's going on uh, in this area. And we're, we're doing uh, work in, in this particular uh, program as well. Uh, also interesting to see that um, other, other people um, or, you know, are thinking about the same way that really if we're going to uh, show technologies that remove carbon dioxide, uh, we really need to have net, a net effect. In other words, we actually take carbon dioxide out of, this, out of the system. This is an example of, um, it's perhaps, I think it's the largest prize for carbon removal that's been offered so far um, by Elon. This one was offered by Elon Musk. And what was noteworthy about it was the solutions that would not be considered. Um, usually uh, these, these types of contests, um, you know, um, don't stipulate such a long list of things that uh, would not be considered. Uh, but it's, it's in interesting and informative to see what isn't considered. Um, it has to be durable. That means you can't have leakage. Uh, it has to be net negative, which means you actually have to take and mitigate carbon dioxide. It's not sufficient just to, you know, uh, capture CO2 and then put it back into the, into the air again. And that, you know, existing um, areas that deplete CO2 uh, based on nature, like old growth forests and other areas, uh, we can't interfere or we shouldn't interfere with that or deep sea CO2 storage. So uh, it just reinforces the whole point of the importance of having a net negative cycle for carbon dioxide. So um, those were some comments about fossil fuels and you know how we how we move how we how those are being dealt with. But the growth of electricity is is uh, very significant in the IEA uh, net zero 2050 plan. And the question is, you know, how do we uh, deal with that elect electrical demand? Um, we expect the global electricity demand will more than double by 2050, uh, with the largest rises being in hydrogen industry and transportation. Uh, what you can see here with the bars shows the increase in electricity demand from uh, between 2020, 2030, and 2050. That's these bars here. And then the other uh, filled in uh, colored um, circles here represent in this particular area, uh, in each area here, how much of that area or the energy demand in that area is related to electricity. So for example, if we look at light duty vehicles, these would be electric vehicles, light passenger electric vehicles, you can see uh, that this is at 75%. That means in that area, light duty vehicles, 75% of the overall energy demand for that area is, is, on, is put on electricity. If we look at hydrogen here, merchant hydrogen, uh, roughly 60, 60 to 65% um, is based on electricity. So it's a very informative, a little detailed, but a very informative. What, what we do see here though is massive growth in, in uh, uh, electricity demand. So the, the obvious question is where does the electricity come from to meet, to meet the demand? And um, what this shows you here is the cost of how renewables have come down um, in, in the last 20 years. And uh, you can see here, for example, this is a, a levelized cost analysis, which means you can compare the values here with the values later uh, at a later point. And you can see, for example, with solar at, uh, 359 uh, dollars here per megawatt hour. That has come down this by 2017 here uh, to about 50 dollars. And if you look at today's price for utility scale uh, photovoltaics, it's now about 39 dollars per megawatt hour. Similarly, uh, though not 
as abrupt, uh, wind has come down significantly in price. Uh, the other thing to take away here is that natural gas, this is natural gas combined cycle power here, is, is more expensive than utility solar or wind. Um, and, and, and coal is much, much more expensive. And then for nuclear, we see that there's actually been some increase in cost here. And this has to do with regulations and siting and things like that. So renewables are at a price point now the one of the lowest cost forms of electricity generation. And uh, they have um, basically um, are, are at less cost now than any of the fossil fuel options. So now if we're talking about subsidizing fossil fuels by adding on carbon uh, capture and utilization, we're only just gonna increase the expense of these fossil fuel options. So that brings me to hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen is the chemical vector for electricity. That means electricity can be turned into hydrogen. Hydrogen can be turned into electricity. So as you'll see, it plays a very important role uh, in the overall energy plan. Um, you probably all heard of different colors of hydrogen. So they all mean different, different things. There's many, actually more colors, but these are the main colors. So gray hydrogen, is just doing steam methane reforming of natural gas to produce hydrogen and the CO2 just goes into the atmosphere. Blue hydrogen means that we also again do steam methane reforming, but then we use carbon capture and sequestration uh, of the carbon dioxide to remove it. And green hydrogen, we just use electricity uh, to produce the hydrogen from water. So as you might expect, uh, provinces like Quebec and British Columbia, uh, which have a high level of hydro and electricity um, in their energy portfolio, are really focused on green hydrogen. Um, this is uh, using electricity to produce uh, hydrogen. Whereas Alberta, which is still very much a fossil fuel uh, province, uh, is focused and pushing the government very hard on carbon capture and storage and forming blue hydrogen. But again, I mentioned there's a number of issues uh, uh, doing this, not the least of which is it can double the cost of producing um, the hydrogen. There's a number of, of different uh, hydrogen plans globally, um, a very significant number. Uh, most countries have uh, hydrogen plans now in their vision. Uh, at least the, all of the signees up to uh, the Paris Accord and the, the COPE meetings do. Uh, so it's a very integral part of the energy plan going forward. So uh, what we can see is that uh, we actually get some type of uh, sector coupling between uh, electricity generation from renewables, which is what you see here, and, and then the hydrogen economy is where we're producing hydrogen. As I mentioned, uh, electricity and water can produce hydrogen or hydrogen can go back to electricity. So uh, the, two, the two are interchangeable. The thing is for very difficult areas to decarbonize like steel, uh, concrete, uh, the chemical industry, agriculture, petrochemical, and the heavy side of transportation, um, hydrogen um, works very well. It's really one of the few, if only, uh, approach uh, to actually decarbonizing those, those sectors. Um, where electricity is being used directly uh, in, uh, is, is in, for example, light, uh, light duty passenger vehicles, some other aspects of mobility, um, for chillers and for heat pumps, for example, and for producing uh, hydrogen. So, you really need the sector coupling of these two areas of electricity and hydrogen uh, to meet um, you know, the requirements that are laid out in the plan. So the question that uh, always comes up is the expense of hydrogen. Um, and the same issues came up uh, even as little as 10 years ago with renewables, which are now um, in many respects, half or less than half the, the the price of any uh, fossil fuel option. Uh, same thing is happening with hydrogen. It's coming down in cost uh, very, very quickly. Uh, 
So here you can see kind of the price today uh, for hydrogen. It can be anywhere from, you know, about three, let's say three US dollars per kilogram up uh, to uh, six. And what you see here is, a, is the way to bring that cost down to something that's in the order of, uh, of one US dollar per kilogram, which then makes it um, very competitive with gasoline and actually cheaper. So this is the, the goal that people are uh, working towards. Uh, the start areas here are areas that we're working on in our research. We're doing quite a bit of research. Uh, I can say as somebody that's working in that area, I definitely can see how this, the cost is going to come down. So one of the approaches is the electrolyzer cost itself. Um, and you can see that the breakdown for that cost up here in the top. Um, generally the fuel cell or the electrolyzer itself uh, accounts for about 60% of the electrolysis uh, system cost. Um, and there's a number of ways of bringing that, that cost down. But then there's the cost of electricity. So as we bring on more renewables, uh, electricity, the cost of electricity is, is cheaper. Um, and, um, and also improving the efficiency has a big benefit and then the lifetime uh, as well. So these are just some of the, the ways of, of bringing the cost of hydrogen down. What I would say is um, we were in a much uh, more difficult situation uh, in the 1980s, uh, for example, with fuel cell technology. Um, at that time, the figures of merit were very, very low. I mean, it, fuel cells have been used in the space program, but they had really, there was little commercial interest and they hadn't advanced from to a point where they were of commercial interest. Um, the figures of merit, uh, this could be cost, this could be stack power density uh, or anything have improved uh, significantly. And what this shows over one decade uh, with focused research and development and product development in this area uh, what happened uh, in this case to stack power density. So it went from about 85 uh, watts per liter uh, over 10 years uh, to 1,310. Today it's over 2,500 watts per, per liter. Um, these were the, the goals that would need to be met uh, for to even be considered for commercial uh, um, car applications. Uh, basically so that the engine wouldn't compromise any space or anything. And it has a very classical uh, shape to it, which happens with all innovation where there's very significant in innovation over a short period of time. And then there's the law of diminishing returns um, after that. And then you're on another technology uh, path. Um, the point of this is that a lot of the hard, heavy lifting that was done here for uh, fuel cells in the um, 80s and 90s and the early uh, 2000s, um, that, that can be built upon for electrolyzers. So it's not like we're starting from scratch like we were here. Uh, we already have a lot of understanding of how to bring electrolyzer uh, cost down and hence the cost of hydrogen down significantly. I would also like to point out that um, scale has, uh, economies of scale have a lot to do with cost as well. And uh, just showing you um, three examples here where you may have a new technology at a very low scale, looks expensive, but uh, once you get out to high volume, it's actually the cheapest option. So it's very important that we compare uh, different technologies that are in the energy plan at suitable volumes to make a valid uh, comparison. What happens is the media and people that are not knowledgeable about this, often we'll compare a price point here at a very low volume with a price point for another technology that's at a very high volume. And that's a completely uh, unreasonable comparison uh, to do. So it's very important to compare um, you know, at a similar type of volume uh, when doing those an analyses. Um, this is a little complicated here, and I, I'll try and simplify it for you. But here we see two uh, bands here. Basically, what the difference in these two is the cost of electricity. So the cost of electricity uh, in the top band there is 65 US dollars per megawatt hour. And in the bottom one here, it's at um, $20 um, per megawatt US dollars. Um, 
in where we are now with the cost of electricity with renewables, uh, we're in between here somewhere. We're closer to the, the bottom one here, but we're still in between. We haven't got down to 20, uh, 20 US dollars per megawatt. So that's the, the first point. So cost of electricity is very important. As we have more uh, penetration of renewables, the cost of electricity will come down. Uh, the other difference you see in each of these bands uh, just has to do with the amount of implemented uh, capacity or volume. So increased volume brings the cost down and then uh, improvements uh, in the overall system and technology uh, brings it further. Here you see uh, this dashed line on the bottom here is kind of where fossil fuels are at, at, at today and the cost, the cost range. And then what you can see here is if you add carbon capture and storage, you're going to uh, increase the cost somewhere in this range up, up to this top range here. So you can see already here, uh, you know, by 2025, um, hydrogen is, is actually starting, is in a range where it's competitive with blue hydrogen and, and it's, it's getting cheaper and eventually will uh, will get uh, uh, quite a bit cheaper than um, fossil fuel uh, supplies. So the, the question is, you know, if we're investing in projects with carbon capture and, and storage, which, you know, could have somewhere between a 30 and 40 year lifetime, does it make, does it make any sense with uh, the energy plan moving forward where we're accelerating technologies like hydrogen production and the mar will the markets even be there? Uh, from a political point of view, it gets votes, but is it the right thing to do? It's a big question mark. So storage is the other key area, and um, that we have to have storage with renewables. So you know, people will say, well, it's better to use electricity directly uh, because of efficiency, and that's absolutely correct. The problem is today um, we have our base load power. Um, as you can see here, but then when we add other forms of energy generation like renewables on top of that, they do not run 100% of the time. And a lot of that energy is curtailed or thrown away. And it's, it, it's a lot of energy. It's in the terawatt hour range. Uh, for example, in Ontario, uh, we uh, had in a recent report shows that about somewhere between six uh, to seven terawatt hours of clean energy in Ontario are thrown away every year. That's just wasted energy uh, that could be used uh, to produce hydrogen uh, or, or other uh, storage uh, media. Um, and so uh, it's much more efficient to make use of this, even if it's not uh, you know, close to 100% efficiency in its conversion. As we move to electricity, the storage becomes more and more important for on the oil side, we, we have quite significant oil storage, for example, it's somewhere in the range of 12 to 16%. And, uh, you know, you'll hear just as we did recently that President Biden was releasing some of the store of oil from the reserves in the US to manage the, the, the pricing on, on gasoline. Uh, but on electricity, we have very little storage capacity capability globally. It's just a fraction of a percent. Um, the oil storage capability we have is good for seasonal storage. That means, you know, we could even run a, a country or, or run everything for a period of, of, of one to several months uh, because we have good storage in place. We don't have that for electricity. So this is a very important area uh, and concern um, that has to be developed. Um, we are starting to see some, uh, you know, large lithium ion battery storage in, in different places around the world. Uh, this is an example in Hornsdale, uh, South Australia. Again, um, this is, uh, you know, reasonably uh, small energy storage. It, what it can do is it can run roughly 30,000 uh, homes for one hour. Uh, but not, not longer than that. And even if you increase as, as is happening or will happen uh, by a factor of 10, the size of the storage capability, it can only run for a few hours. So it's not suitable for seasonal storage. That's uh, basically what, what this, uh, this 
this shows here is that these are different technologies for storage. And uh, what they show here are the energy storage on the bottom here and the power here. Um, so what you can see it kind of in the middle region here, there are a number of options for storage if, if you don't need a lot of energy storage. Um, for example, lithium ion batteries. Uh, but uh, as you get out here to very large storage, um, you know, could be in the terawatt region, for example, like we were just talking about in Ontario. Um, then you need other other ways of storage. So pumped hydro is is a is a good storage method if you have the right geology uh, for that. Uh, compressed air is another one here. Uh, but for very large seasonal storage, where we're talking, you know, a month or more. Um, Hydrogen and uh, nat synthetic natural gas have been two of the key options there. The problem is that natural gas, of course, now because of the climate change issue has fallen out of favor uh, because it's potentially a source of fugitive uh, methane, uh, which will have an impact, a very big impact on, on climate change. So the preference now is to move to hydrogen as the key uh, storage. And what we're seeing, for example, in Germany is that areas that um, uh, salt caverns, for example, in Northern Germany that would be used for uh, in the past for natural gas storage are now being converted for, uh, to hydrogen storage. Um, but again, it's a process uh, and I'll show that in a moment that that's starting to be accelerated now because of what's happening in Europe, uh, but it, it takes time to do that. So we have to look at opportunities with the infrastructure that we already have. And um, when you think that we're uh, implementing a significant number of renewables, we often have some type of storage uh, system. Uh, we have pipelines and we have grid. We have to look at the opportunities where, um, where we have intersection of some of this infrastructure and we can make use uh, of it in the new energy uh, plans going forward. And so again, if we can convert electricity uh, into hydrogen, we can put hydrogen into pipelines uh, with natural gas, for example, uh, but also pipelines can be converted uh, to carry hydrogen as, as well. So uh, we have opportunities where we have intersection of, of, of these different um, pieces of infrastructure and don't have to necessarily create new, new infrastructure uh, to be able to use them. And uh, I would show you this. I tried to find a similar uh, type of graphic for Canada. I wasn't able to do that. But this shows the natural gas uh, pipeline network in the United States. You can see it's very heavy in the more industrial uh, belt areas. And also the elect uh, electrical transmission grid here. So where these two networks um, overlap, where there's opportunities, um, and also opportunities for sinking uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, these become very important um, areas for, for taking the, you know, the energy plan uh, forward. Um, one of the big issues we have with these uh, is, uh, you know, not only making use of the existing infrastructure, creating new infrastructure. And I, you know, one of the, the biggest examples of that, of course, is for transportation. Um, so here you see electric vehicles on the right-hand side with chargers. Here you see a fuel cell vehicle and something that's very similar to the, what we have today with garages. The price of these two ve commercial vehicles is very similar. Um, so that it's not really a choice uh, between that. Uh, charging times, of course, are much longer here. Uh, this is like a, a three minute bill here. Um, the question and the issue primarily is one of, of infrastructure. And there's been some very uh, large studies that have been done. Um, and I just, I picked one example here from the Forschungszentrum in, uh, in Germany. This was done for the German government. It's one of the largest research centers uh, where they looked at the costing of in Germany of infrastructure for uh, lightweight passenger vehicles, uh, comparing putting an electrical grid infrastructure uh, versus uh, structure for hydrogen for fuel. And what you can see is at the very beginning uh, and early on for very low volumes, there is definitely an advantage 
for the electric uh, vehicle. And that's because it can use the existing grid. But at some point, a lot of new infrastructure has to be put in. Uh, otherwise the grid will just shut down. Uh, and the expense of doing that is very, very high. And so once you get up to large numbers of vehicles, in this case, let's say at 20 uh, million vehicles, um, the fuel cell electric vehicle infrastructure is quite a bit cheaper than the electric vehicle structure. So this will vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, you know, Germany has a very well established, uh, and I've done a lot of work in Germany, um, also for their government too, uh, has a very well established um, electric grid. Um, and, you know, so they're, they're basing this on something where they already have a lot of of structure. So in Canada, we're talking, or at least our federal government's talking about being completely electric vehicle uh, by 2035, I think it is. Uh, but I didn't see anything in the budget about, um, you know, new uh, grid infrastructure or upgrading that. So um, I, I believe that this is an issue that's that we're, we're going to run run into. If you look at BC, for example, which has the I believe in North America, the largest percentage of, on a per capita basis of EV vehicles that have been bought, I believe it was around 12% last year. Uh, most people think, well, that's 12% uh, EVs in, in British Columbia, but actually the percentage of electric vehicles in British Columbia is only about 1.1%. That's just uh, purchased a new, new vehicles. So, um, you know, as, as, as we have more and more electric vehicles coming on board, the infrastructure is going to become more of a problem and will have to be addressed. And just to give you a sense of what's required to move into uh, battery uh, vehicles, particularly lightweight vehicles, uh, because that's where batteries actually shine. As you move to heavier transport, whether it's freighters, uh, large trains, large uh, trucks, uh, hydrogen has significant advantages over, over battery vehicles. But if you kind of look at the profile here for the increase, so this is the increase in energy required on here, and on this side is the, um, the performance of the types of batteries that we need. You can see this very significant increase uh, in, in energy that's required for, uh, for batteries. Um, and then here on the yellow line here, uh, this is the technologies that we need. So you see here, a Tesla 3 would have a lithium ion battery here, uh, but then we would have to improve uh, the watt hours per kilogram significantly. When, and we are, you know, people are working on solid state. I'm pretty sure we're gonna get here, but then getting even to higher uh, performance requirements to meet these, uh, meet these requirements. Um, the scale of the growth of the lithium battery industry is, is absolutely um, huge. And uh, if I could put some context on that, um, you know, we only have several gigafactories today. So uh, the gigafactory, for example, in Nevada, right now it produces uh, half a million battery packs. So that's a half, enough for half a million electric vehicle cars. Uh, but in order to meet the requirements in the energy plan uh, using battery vehicles, we would need to be producing roughly uh, 20 to 25 uh, gigafactories every year, at least out to two, uh, 2030 or 2035. Uh, these are ma mammoth um, in, you know, um, industrial sites. So it's a very significant uh, requirement and it's gonna be very difficult uh, to meet those requirements. Um, on the battery side, we, we do a lot of work in, in different types of batteries, uh, including the lithium battery. And I just would mention this, uh, some of the work that we're doing. Um, we started off uh, in general, um, uh, lithium batteries start off with lithium metal batteries, but they were found to be dangerous uh, because they form what's called a dendrite. Um, and uh, this causes electric shorting, and uh, there's a lot of components in the cell um, that, that potentially could be dangerous. Uh, but we had what, you know, Molly Energy was a, in Vancouver actually did some of the leading work in met lithium metal batteries. 
um, and then was brought out by the um, uh, by a Japanese uh, consortium, and, and that technology moved to uh, to Asia. Uh, then we went moved from there to lithium ion batteries, um, which, uh, as you probably know, uh, the three people that did a lot of work in that area won the Nobel Prize for that a couple of years ago. Um, but what you can see here is that the capacity in terms of milliamp hours is much less for lithium ion batteries than for metal based uh, batteries. And um, solid state would be in this area here using lithium metal. Uh, we're working on a new type of battery here where there's no lithium metal, but you put lithium metal down on the first, uh, first charge. Uh, the issue you can see here in the bottom is that the cycle life is very low at this, at this point, even though the efficiency is high. Uh, but if we are successful with that, we could actually increase um, the volume capability by 40%. So that's like a 40% increase in range and, and performance. So these are some of the areas that people are working on to advance uh, batteries. So I'm getting uh, near the end of, of my talk here. I, I want to talk a little bit about the environmental focus. We all, all know about the triple bottom line where we try to balance social, economic, and environment. The environment's uh, generally you know, put as, a, as a, a circle here, and there's an intersecting area that, that's good. Um, I would like to argue that everything we're doing now uh, should be within an environmental or eco context, not an anthropogenic um, context. Um, because of the issues that, uh, that potentially we, we can create. And we have very good examples, you know, with climate change and, and pollution and every, everything else. So whatever path we're taking forward, we really need to make sure that the environmental context of it is, is front and foremost, while we balance the social and, and economic aspects. So that means our technology and policy um, can help to get us in a sustainable uh, region. So what, again, coming back to batteries, um, one of the biggest concerns is the environmental impact with increasing demand on lithium. And uh, here you see some of the solars or the brine pools, for example, in the Atacama Desert. Um, there's an area in in South America, around Chile and Bolivia, a uh, triangle lith called the lithium triangle. Other countries have a lot of lithium too, including, including Canada, um, as long as we, uh, we keep it and we don't sell it. Um, the, um, the, the issue here is that there, there's a lot of in potential environmental issues uh, and a lot of the same issues that perhaps we've had with oil and gas, which we ideally want, want to avoid. So roughly 50% comes from these brine, brine pools, 50% of lithium and 50% um, from hard, hard rock. Uh, now there are plans on the table to start doing deep sea uh, mining. Uh, this is an area that's had very little study. Um, there's uh, several South uh, Pacific Islands, um, which potential areas for this to possibly uh, take place. Um, interestingly, uh, Canadian mining companies are involved with, with this. However, uh, there's little understanding of the environmental effects um, and there would be very little oversight or regulation as, as well. And so this is obviously a very, a very big concern if we start moving uh, re our resource extraction into other areas uh, that are environmentally uh, sensitive. Um, so with respect to, to lithium, um, we have been able to uh, create a company called Mangrove Lithium, which is um, involved with the chemical processing of, of lithium. And that can be either from hard, hard rock or brine. Um, what this chemical processing does is it cuts out a lot of the, um, the chemicals that are required and a lot of the steps in the processing. And it's very flexible. And it's able to use low-grade uh, deposits as well. Um, 
so what we're trying to do is address not only the um, supply issue of lithium, but also the environmental aspect of that. And uh, we've been quite successful. We uh, recently received funding from the Bill, Bill Gates um, uh, venture. Um, and um, and uh, we're, you know, the technology is moving forward very quickly. Here you can see in the bottom right here, the type of gap that we're talking about in terms of what the demand looks like and, and what the gap is here uh, for lithium carbonate and lithium hydroxide, which are, or battery grade, I should say, which are important for, uh, for the lithium batteries. So there's a very significant gap here that has to be filled. Um, and uh, our technology would help with that as well as um, be much more environmentally uh, friendly as well. So uh, the question that most people ask, or many people ask, well, you know, if lithium is limited in its quantity, along with many of the other uh, chemicals that are required, uh, particularly nickel, for example, but also, also manganese and cobalt, uh, probably have heard about issues with cobalt um, being mined in Africa. Why don't we just move to iron and sodium, which are at least 10 times more abundant or to 10 to a thousand times more abundant uh, because these are also battery materials. The problem is that the performance is not nearly as good as lithium. Uh, lithium is the lightest, uh, lightest and most active metal uh, possible uh, for a battery. So every time you move to a more earth abundant material where there may be less uh, resource issues, um, you're taking a hit in performance and uh, that's the trade-off that's difficult to, uh, to balance. So um, just finishing up here on, on the geopolitical side of things, um, we know that energy should be cheap and it should be available for worldwide peace and prosperity. Uh, certainly re renewables are moving us in that direction because every jurisdiction in the world has some form of renewable energy. And many and most jurisdictions have access to some form of water as well. Um, the issue that we have right now, of course, with fossil fuels is that a uh, few countries control it and it's become weaponized. And uh, you know, a good example of that, which we're reading about every day is the control by Russia of the flow of natural gas and oil and coal uh, to Western Europe. Uh, at one point, um, about 80, 85% of natural gas from Russia went through Ukraine, and uh, they've been, Russia's gradually turned off the tap on those pipelines. So now, before the war started, uh, perhaps uh, there was only about 12% going through there. Uh, Germany has been using um, this pipeline in the top left hand corner here. This is the Nord Stream 1 pipeline, and there's another one, Nord Stream 2, which is being built, uh, which at this point, uh, Germany is probably going to shut down, uh, but they're heavily invested. We're talking here mil billions of dollars that have been put into that by not only Germany, but by, by other European countries. So um, there's a whole geopolitical aspect uh, to the supply of, of fossil fuels. Very interesting articles being written, uh, you know, in The Economist, for example, and many other uh, talking about a petrol state versus an electoral state, uh, the potential for the same issues we have with the petrol state happening uh, when we move to electrification and particularly depending on, on how, how, how we do that. So we, we have to, to try to find methods of moving forward with the energy plan that still allow for worldwide peace and uh, some form of, of prosperity. The reality of it is, is that now with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, there are an enormous problems. Um, if there's a bright light in, in everything that's happened recently in the last couple of months, is that it's actually accelerating in Europe, the energy transition um, according to the IEA uh, plan, I mean, following that, that plan. 
So to move away from fossil fuels and to uh, go more heavily into renewables and, and all the other things that go with that, uh, hydrogen, uh, et cetera. Um, we can learn a lot from looking at Germany and, and its, um, its distribution of energy. So you can see, um, you know, there's a very significant amount of Germany's energy does come already from renewables, about 41%, that's 238 terawatts. But they still have significant natural gas um, and coal as well as well as nu nuclear as, uh, as part of their energy portfolio. Um, the government, uh, particularly um, the previous government uh, under uh, Chancellor Merkel, um, was working hard to shut down the the whole nu nuclear part of of Germany and some of the the um, parties that are strongly in favor of that. But, but with what has happened recently, uh, it's back on the table. So it's, it's somewhat doubtful that it's going to uh, be shut down um, because they um, need to, if they're gonna become, if Germany, as an example, is gonna become independent, it needs to have this still. Uh, but the question is how quickly can they ramp up so they have no dependence on these other fossil fuels that come uh, from Russia. So basically uh, natural gas has become a weapon now in the hands of, of, of Russia and um, it's, it's created a lot of issues for Western uh, Europe. So as I said, the, the highlight here is that this is accelerating the energy transition in Germany and in the rest of Europe. And I think we're gonna see very significant and fast changes uh, change in Europe uh, itself. And I, I wanna give you one example of what a German Germany is doing. Uh, they're fast tracking uh, these green hydrogen hubs here, um, which would not only include hydrogen that, that Germany is producing itself, but they would be importing it for example, from uh, other countries as well, especially Africa. Um, the target for one of these hubs in the Northern Sea, it's a port city, they already have some structure in place there already, is 250 terawatts per year. So if you look here, all the renewables in Germany account for about 238 terawatt hours. So I think that gives you, I mean, this is seasonal, hydrogen-based storage. Um, this is a massive amount of, of, of hydrogen uh, that will be stored there. And they're talking about, or, or they started on other hubs uh, as, as well. So the whole energy uh, portfolio and transition, um, you know, is being accelerated in Europe. And a lot, of, a lot of things are also happening in Asia. I haven't talked about that either. So, um, just uh, close to finishing up here, you know, really nuclear energy is not off the table. Um, certainly there were a number of issues, you know, that we've seen in the past, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, of course, and in 2011, uh, Fukushima. Uh, this is old technology. Uh, a lot of people are looking at the small modular reactors as a potential, the more distributed, potentially could be made on a manufacturing line uh, by large companies like you know, General Electric, for example, um, which would bring the cost down. The, the issue is that the cost is still quite a bit more expensive than renewables, uh, but still um, it would definitely uh, could, play, uh, could play an important role, role going forward. And then uh, there's always fusion, which everybody talks about that it will be ready in another 25 years. Um, it is moving forward. And I, I would draw your attention to the International uh, Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor in um, Cateresh, which is in Aix-en-Provence. It's uh, about 80% complete at this point. Uh, so uh, potentially uh, could be on board um, by the end of this decade. Um, although not all the subsystems have been completely um, tested out, out yet, and there still are, are challenges. And, um, you know, just mentioning in our own backyard here, we have General Fusion, uh, which is looking at a new type of plasma, plasma-based um, 
fusion. Um, and uh, that's, that's right here in our own neighborhood. And there's a lot of global interest in, in, in what they're doing. So I think it's, I, I don't think we uh, are able to write off uh, nuclear power uh, yet. And, and I think fusion, if we get it to work well, uh, will we'll be a game changer as well. It'll be a very important part of our, of our energy plan. Uh, there's a lot of closing thoughts here um, and probably far too much uh, to kind of go through all of them, but I'll go through just a, a couple here. So, you know, very key to the net zero 2050 plan is electrification of the energy system and the phasing out of fossil fuels. So very different point now than where we were, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, there are a lot of potential issues with carbon capture and, and storage. Uh, yeah, maybe it has a, a place in the, in the transition, the short term, uh, but it should not put us down a path. Uh, otherwise we're gonna be, uh, you know, um, catching up again and be behind everybody else. Um, the renewables are, are, are very important. Uh, even in Alberta, which today has about 12%, uh, renewables in, by 2030, that will be well over 30%. So uh, it has a very, a very active growth in, in that area right at the moment, even though it's not talked about a lot. Um, hydrogen batteries are two of the, the main approaches to energy storage, bringing that on, particularly hydrogen uh, for the decarbonization of the energy system. And, um, you know, I we talked about the importance of the transportation sector and how we move forward with that. At the end of the day, I think you know, we'll have transport based on battery systems, hydrogen and biofuel, and, um, and then the environmental consequences of, of what we're doing. And um, you know, I would like to just end, uh, this is an interesting quote uh, here from Fatih. Um, we have an enormous challenge ahead of us uh, to balance all, all of these things um, for climate change, for sustainability, and for geopolitical stability. Um, and you know, many people call this um, problem the, the Mount Everest of all problems. We've been able to solve other issues like the issues with DDT, for example, the ozone uh, layer depletion, um, but this problem, the magnitude of it and the intricacy of it and, and getting everybody on the same page has been an enormous challenge. Even after 26 COPE meetings, we still have not made any significant progress. So I think there is hope, but it's, uh, it's, it's a very big challenge. So I, I, I'll end there and uh, take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, David. That was a, a wonderful talk with uh, many, many wonderful illustrations and uh, a lot of new information for many of us. I have a few questions here. I'd like to sure. go off the chat if you'd be willing to answer them. Um, Absolutely. First question is, what about the materials that have to go into making renewable energy? For example, steel and glass. Is the production of those materials not bad for the environment? Well, it's, it's a very good question. So anything that we do, we, we have to uh, do a life cycle analysis on it. And uh, uh, certainly even in some technologies that, uh, and, and components that we're looking in the, at in the new energy system, um, their production has, has to be improved by a life cycle uh, point of view. Um, so if you know, for example, if you're looking at uh, solar-based, uh, you know, photovoltaics, right? Um, you know, you the silicon-based PVs that we produce have a lot of uh, environmental issues, right? But the, some of the next generations now uh, of that um, have reduced those issues significantly. Uh, these are non-silicon-based um, solutions, so it is absolutely an important uh, consideration. Not, you know particularly from a, a pollution uh, point of view, and also an energy use point of view as well. Like how much energy does it take uh, to make these, um, these different components? So um, 
I don't have a silver bullet um, answer for that, but what I can say is that the, for the most part, the technology is there to improve manufacturing and reduce from a life cycle point of view, the impact of, of making these, uh, these assets in the first place. Good, thank you. And the uh, next question is, how are F cell vehicles refueled? Um, I think you said uh, maybe three minutes it took to accomplish this. Yes, yeah, so it's basically just like filling your car uh, with, uh, we're talking about hydrogen-based vehicles, I think, um, right? Probably, yeah, so it wasn't stated. Yeah, so it's, it's very similar. Uh, to, uh, to how you uh, fill a, 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 gas, um, a gas engine today. Um, you basically, uh, you have a pump and, and you, you have a, um, a, a distribution head that you just push in, insert in, into, um, in, into the um, side. And um, it, usually the fill time is anywhere between two and four minutes. Mm -hmm. And then the range, uh, depending on the type of vehicle, uh, you know, could be anywhere from 450 kilometers to 800 or more. Wow, good. For light, that's a light, a lightweight passenger vehicle. Right. What causes the discrepancy in reported carbon capture at Quest, whereby, whereby Shell claims 90% capture and an independent study claims that it's only 39%? Is the independent study performing life cycle analysis on energy inputs or the facility, whereas Quest or Shell is not? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. So the 90% is when I, maybe I should have made that clear, that's typically by proponents of, of carbon capture and storage or carbon capture utilization and storage. That's the number that's used in their modeling and everything. Um, but the reality of it is for most cases, whether it's Quest or not, it's much, much lower. And the audit that was done at Quest, I believe was, a, was an, an, an overall audit from, from source uh, to actual use of the, the hydrogen uh, in their upgrading facility. So um, yeah, it was signif it's significantly less. I mean, it was, um, I actually, I, I'm sorry, I actually don't know the exact number that Shell was reporting on that, but in general, um, uh, people consider that CCUS or CCS um, captures at least 90%, which is not, not true. And it has, it, it has to be very carefully regulated and, and audited as well um, if, you know, if, if goals are in place to reduce CO2 emissions. I'm not sure we have that ability in Canada to, to closely monitor <laughs> all these emission, potential emission sites, right? Mm -hmm. And the next question um, is asking basically about uh, nuclear energy, which you've touched on. Um, says uh, nuclear reactors, we don't uh, form uh, um, uh, carbon uh, emission fuels. We don't, um, uh, it's not uh, polluting in the same way anyway. Do you support plans to dramatically increase Canada's nuclear capacity with small for example, a small modular reactors and a fourth generation molten salt reactors. Um, yeah, I, I actually do. Um, I particularly in the transition uh, because I, I think that's a better, a better path to where we need to get to, for example, than, than carbon capture and sequestration. Um, Although there's the economic aspect of it, and you, in any of these transitions, you can't you can't create a shock shockwave. But I think there definitely is a role, I I believe, for um, for that in Canada. Um, first of all, Canada has uh, lots of uh, resource base for that. 
They also have the know-how. We have experience with with that. Um, so you know, I, it there there are issues, particularly from the cost point of view. So um, because because the, the, even the modular uh, reactors are still more expensive than renewables. Um, but I think if that helps us with base load and helps us to solve the, the climate uh, change issue, um, I think the, the downside is not, you know, is not as, as, as bad. They're much safer today. Um, you know, there's less uh, radioactive waste. Um, there's, a, there's many pluses too, right? The biggest argument I think is that that people have against them is that they're just too expensive compared to other other options. So, uh, you know, I think in Canada we have very good solar and very good wind and uh, many other sources of of renewables, uh, biomass, uh, ge geothermal. I mean, we we should really be moving very quickly um, in in that direction. But I think there's mm -hmm. definitely room for, uh, for particularly the small modular nuclear reactors. Yeah, well, we're, um, there are two more questions I'd like to ask. This is such an important topic. I think uh, I'd like to try and get them in, so. Yeah, yeah, no <laughs> would, problem. <laughs> would sodium iron batteries have a place for storing energy in place, e.g. close to wind or solar farms? Yes, so um, I, I think the answer there is, is yes. Um, so I, I mentioned about the loss in performance that we get going to more abundant uh, material-based uh, batteries, but for storage uh, of electricity where the, the size of the battery or the footprint of the battery uh, is not that important, um, I think uh, there's a lot of, um, room for other chemistries using more earth abundant uh, materials. And so I think we should definitely be moving in that, in that direction. Um, and the other direction we need to be moving in is to, you know, to a circular economy. I, I should have mentioned something about that where we're recycling. Um, that'll be particularly important with lithium batteries. Um, once we get a critical mass of them, in play uh, than to be able to recycle them and, and re reuse them. So I think, um, I, I think different chemistries, particularly for uh, storage, uh, uh, make a lot of sense. Um, we, we've done you know, some work in that area as well, like zinc manganese oxide look at uh, moderately high temperature um, batteries as well. Um, well, they can't be used in an electric vehicle, they definitely could be used for storage in, and coupled with renewables. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answers that question. I think, I think these other chemistries uh, offer a lot of possibilities. Okay, and the uh, final one, I think I'll end on this one. Um, your focus primarily been on the supply side for energy. Aren't there huge opportunities on reducing the demand side with better urban design, passive houses, uh, micro-ability, transit car sharing, yeah. e-communications, et cetera. Uh, so I think that may be a little bit outside of your talk, but that uh, this no, is- No, actually, I, I, did, um, I did comment on it and it, it actually showed up in several, um, several of the slides. So um, that is absolutely part of the overall plan as well. Um, and you will see in some of the bar charts that there's a certain amount that uh, is related to that, reduced demand and improved efficiency. Um, it's in combination with the, with the supply side. So absolutely, um, it's, it's part of the plan as, as well. So um, yeah, I, I'm sorry, maybe I should have emphasized that uh, a, 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 bit, a bit more, um, but in terms of getting to net zero 2050, um, that, that is also in, in that plan as well. Mm -hmm. 
and efficiency, of course, is very, very important too. I mean, that's, um, that's an expected uh, requirement in a lot of the technologies as well. Well, thank you, David, very, very much. Uh, I think you've educated a lot of us with your uh, lovely clear slides and uh, the uh, attention to detail on them um, and uh, the possibilities uh, and efficiencies of one action over another action. So uh, we hear a lot of this stuff from politicians uh, from time to time, but it's so much better to hear from the people doing the actual research. So thank you, David, very, very much. Oh, you're welcome, and it's uh, it's been a pleasure talking uh, talking to everybody as well. It's a very important topic, and it's a very heated and highly debated area mm -hmm. as well. Um, and uh, you know, different countries are taking somewhat different approaches, but um, I think it's really good to have an open discussion around the whole the whole area. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. I think the, yeah. there are comments coming in thanking you from many, many of the uh, part, uh, audience members. And I think uh, the, the uh, talk is being recorded, so these should be recorded as well and you can see them, but uh, okay. people have appreciated <laughs> Thank you. your talk. People Thank have you for the opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, David. Thank you. So this is the last general meeting of the year for, um, for Emeritus College. And uh, I'd just like to remind people that um, the event, the actual last event, is um, the CURAC conference on May the 19th. And this event is organized this year by the Emeritus College in partnership with the University of Victoria, um, Simon Fraser University, and the focus is on the topic of wellness and well being. It is free and open to all, and registration is on our website. So thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming today and being such a supportive audience. And uh, we'll try and get a good program in place for next year. And we'll see you then.